Coming off Monday Night Raw, which was honestly one of the best Raws that I have seen in years. Tonight on SmackDown, we did not have The Rock. We did not have Cody Rhodes. We did not have CM Punk in Chicago. We did not have any of that on the show tonight. Uh, although there was a big hint that was dropped by Paul Heyman. As far as the future of this Bloodline storyline is concerned, the power struggle that is coming... Uh, but tonight, what they did do was they let the rest of the roster have their chance to shine and get their stuff in. So we didn't have an overly long bloodline segment or anything like that. For, for a change, the focus was not on Roman, Rock, Seth, and Cody, which is really what has dominated this entire build to WrestleMania. Obviously, they have the main event of night one feeding into the main event of night two. Everything else has felt largely secondary. And so tonight, I think in a lot of ways, is a show that we, we needed to see. I think we needed to have some more of the focus on everything else for a change. It, also, clearly, they're saving the big guns for next week for the go-home shows. We have Rock and Roman coming to the Barclays Center for Raw this Monday. And then, of course, next Friday is going to be the night before uh, WrestleMania. But the show, you know, tonight obviously was not as uh, fun as Monday's show was. Monday's show was excellent. Uh, but I thought it served its purpose. We had one new WrestleMania match announced. We had another WrestleMania match teased. Uh, and we had the final two teams added to complete the lineup for the Tag Team Championship ladder match that is coming up in Philly next weekend. Tonight, though, is all about the arrival of Jade Cargill. Now, Jade Cargill has been with the company now for several months, many months. But she wasn't ready. She wasn't ready for prime time, even though she looks like a million bucks. She wasn't ready for prime time. Triple H made comments to that effect a few months ago at one of their uh, media scrums, post-show media conferences, where he basically took a, a shot, a not so indirect shot at the training that she had in AEW and said, well, we may have underestimated what we had to work with here. So she's been training. She's been largely hidden. She's made a few appearances on TV in the months since. She would look very impressive in the Royal Rumble, but the Royal Rumble is very different than having a match. It's very different than going in there and having a singles match or even a tag team match. The Royal Rumble, you can go in there, you know, you have your spots that you do. She looked very impressive. And then after that, she sort of vanished up until recently. And then Nick Aldis made the announcement that they had landed her the biggest free agent signing that they've had on SmackDown in a while. 
Jade Cargill was coming to Friday night. Tonight she signed her contract, but that was not the only thing that she did on this show. And I thought as far as setting her up for success on SmackDown, they did a great job tonight. Because there are two very important things that this woman did. She came out, signed her contract, and she put the entire roster on notice. That was her mission statement. And then she came back out at the end of the show and she made the save for the baby faces in distress. She came out, she dominated, and she showed on night one why she is going to be one of the dominant players in this women's division on SmackDown. So they are already setting her up for success. And she is going to end up in a match at WrestleMania, but I think it's the best scenario for her because she's not going to be in a one-on-one -on -one match. She's going to be, very likely, it's not official yet, uh, but it will be a trios match. And so she'll have not one but two tag team partners. And I thought as far as handling her debut on night one that they really could not have done a better job than they did. So to that end, it was a big success. But this is your SmackDown review for Friday, March 29th, 2024. I am the Solo Monster, the final stream, the final SmackDown here for the month of March. Like and subscribe, 400 likes. If you hit that thumbs up button 400 times, you will do Be the Booker. Here tonight, our final Be the Booker of the month. Super chats are open, and so if you want to support me and what I do, if you have a question, comment about tonight's show, you can drop a super chat, and I'll be reading those as well. And I want to take a moment here to thank you for a great March. As we close out the month, let's finish out strong. Let's get ready for a big April. Uh, I've got a very busy week coming up next week. A lot going on heading into WrestleMania, and I will tell you more about that on Sunday. We'll save that for the podcast on Sunday. That'll be episode 855. But for now, tonight, we got a cold open to tonight's episode with Corey Graves welcoming us to SmackDown, introducing a video montage of some of the footage of Rock's beatdown of Cody Rhodes at the end of Raw on Monday night. And I'm being told now that it has since been confirmed by Nick Aldis on Twitter, where all things are confirmed, that the six-person tag will take place at WrestleMania. And it will be Bianca Belair, Naomi, and Jade Cargill taking on Asuka, Kyrie Sane, and Dakota Kai of Damage Control. So not only one, but two WrestleMania matches made official tonight, uh, which is why this show was important. It may not have been as exciting as the show from Monday night, but like I said, it served an important purpose. But again, the beginning of the show, we got some footage from the beatdown angle at the end of Raw Monday night where Cody Rhodes got his ass handed to him by The Rock. And uh, they were uh, teasing, though, that they were going to show us more of it a little bit later on. The part they showed was Cody getting slammed into the side of his own bus and getting his blood smeared all over the Rock's weight belt that said Mama Rhodes on it. They also showed Solo Sokoa, Jimmy Uso, and Paul Heyman backstage arriving at the building earlier in the day, as well as Bianca Belair and Damage Control also shown at different times arriving at the venue earlier in the day. The opening match was Randy Orton teaming up with Kevin Owens to take on Pretty Deadly. Owens and Orton, two of the three men involved in the U.S. title match at WrestleMania next weekend. Orton got suplexed onto the announce desk ahead of the first commercial break. He rallied. He eventually made the tag to Owens, and he attempted a swanton bomb, but Kit Wilson got the knees up. Orton attacked Wilson on the floor, and he set up to superplex, or not suplex, uh, or superplex rather, but to superplex, uh, to superplex someone is something we saw later in the show, uh, but that's for later. Right now, he suplexed them onto the announce desk. Elton Prince intervened, and the referee turned his back on Owens while this was going on, and that allowed Logan Paul to run out from underneath the ring, and he gets inside, and he KOs KO with the brass knuckles punch. And then he scurries out of the ring and right back underneath like a thief in the night. Elton Prince realizes that Kevin Owens is down and so he scrambles to make the cover and Elton Prince pins Kevin Owens to win the match for Pretty Deadly. So look at that, Pretty Deadly picked up a win. When was the last time we saw that? I can't even remember. 
Now, Orton gets in the ring, and he was confused about what happened here, and he was upset. And Owens is down, he's holding his face, Orton is pissed, but then Orton looks up at the Tron, and they showed a replay of what happened at the end of the match when Logan Paul ran in, and then he understood. But he also realized something else, because he saw Logan Paul leave the ring and go back under the ring. So he's looking around to the crowd, he's kind of stomping the mat, and Orton exits the ring. And he proceeds to lift up the ring skirt. And guess who he found? He found Logan Paul laying there on the ground. So he smacked him around for a little bit. He got Paul on top of the announce desk. And he was setting up for the RKO. When Pretty Deadly attacked from behind, they broke things up. Orton and Owens, they disposed of the two of them. That allowed Logan, though, to get away through the crowd. Even as Orton chased after him all the way to the back into the parking lot area. Again, one consistent shot for the most part here. Have I, have I mentioned how much I'm enjoying these shows not having as many camera cuts? As many nauseating camera cuts as we were accustomed to seeing every single week on these television shows? Because I think it's worth mentioning. For as much as I bitched and moaned about it, the fact that we're not getting it, or not getting it as much, is a refreshing change. Yet another production change that I welcome. So again, he chased Logan Paul to the back. Now, Logan Paul, he ended up jumping into a classic Corvette that was parked there, that was waiting for him, and he drove off uh, before Randy Orton could catch up with him. Not much to it, a pretty basic angle, and honestly, I was surprised that they didn't build up more tension between Orton and Owens since we're this close to WrestleMania. But then they announced later in the show that on SmackDown next week, which is the night before... They're doing a KO show, and Randy Orton is going to be a guest of his on the Kevin Owens show. So they're waiting until 24 hours before, but I suspect that if there's going to be any tension between the two challengers, that's where we're going to get it. Now, after a break, we got a pre-taped interview with subtitles, a vignette here, with the women's champion, the WWE women's champion, Io Sky. She said Bailey started damage control because she was lost, not because she wanted to help new talent. She latched onto them to get back in the spotlight again and only wanted them to succeed so that she could steal the credit. She called Bailey a narcissist who loves to claim that she's a victim. And now you all, talking to the fans, you all feel sorry for her. She said that our hypocrisy disgusts her. But she knows that Bailey did play a role in her becoming champion. But she made Bailey relevant. And Dakota and her felt obligated to keep her around, but their patience wore thin. They got tired of her. They outgrew Bailey, so she did what needed to be done. She said there was a time that she saw Bailey as her friend, and she will regret that for the rest of her life. Bailey is an embarrassment to this company, and she hopes that after WrestleMania, she will never see her again. And you heard from off camera, you heard the director. Basically, you say, cut, you know, the segment is over, good job. And then Bailey attacked. And they fought around for a little bit until they went crashing through the green screen behind them. And everybody jumped up to go separate them. And I don't know how many of you spotted it, but I saw a wild Jeremy Borash in the background. There he was, trying to separate these two ladies. So this is a good angle. Again, they're, they're kind of limited at this point of what they can do. I mean, you could do the kind of tired contract signing segment if you want to. Um, we, we've had promos from Bailey. We've had uh, some segments from Damage Control. Usually it's Dakota who does the talking. Here we got to hear from the champion. I thought this was a good segment. And again, you know, we're, we're kind of at the point here with this, with this program, with this feud where there isn't a whole lot left for them to do. We got another damage control angle with the other women at the end of the show. But as far as Bailey and EO, uh, this is pretty much the sort of thing I would have expected. So I thought it was fine. I thought it was fine. SmackDown general manager Nick Aldis was in the ring for the next segment. It was the official contract signing for the latest addition to the SmackDown roster, specifically to the women's division. and. 
This person, of course, was none other than Jade Cargill. So we got the first official entrance of Jade Cargill on SmackDown. They lower the lights, and of course they have all the screens and everything, and they've got their you know video, which is like the wind blowing or whatever. You know, a storm is coming. And you, all you see is her silhouette, and she's there, and she's doing the double bicep pose. You can't see her, it's just the shadow. But then the lights come on, and they gave her the Sting entrance from AEW, where we have snow falling in the building. So she walks out, and I, you know, I look at this woman. First of all, the silhouette pose, right? And then the lights come on, and you look at her, and of course she looks unbelievable. But she really does. She looks like she just jumped off the pages of a comic book. Like, if they wanted to start a comic book series dedicated to her, like, I wouldn't be surprised. She's She would be the perfect person to have something like that. She will be in a Marvel movie one day. <laughs> if not, then I don't understand why not. But as soon as she got in the ring, first thing she did, there was no formal, hey, take a seat, and she just signed the contract. She took the microphone, and she said she wanted to make herself crystal clear. They have one of the best female rosters in the world. So the first thing that she did was she put over the roster. She didn't, she didn't come on here on this show and berate everybody and say that everybody is inferior and everybody is no good and finally you have somebody that's worth a damn. She put over the roster, which is what you should do. Because these are the women that she's going to be working with. These are the women that she's going to be facing. And it's one of those things where... Over the years, when you have people feuding sometimes, and let's say the heel in the feud is saying, this guy's a joke. You suck. You're a loser, right? On and on and on. Sometimes the story fits. You know, maybe the guy's a bully. That's the sort of thing they would do. But I find that to be counterproductive. And it's more effective when you have somebody, whether they're a heel or a babyface, put the other person over and say, look, I may not like you, but I respect you put over their accomplishments, put over the championships they've won and the people they've beaten, whatever it may be. Because then if you go on to beat that person, it makes you look that much more impressive. Well, what good does it do you if you're feuding with somebody and you go out there and say, hey, you're a fucking joke. When was the last time you won a match? <laughs> so it's just the simple things like that that might not strike anybody as a big deal. To me, though, I think that's what you want to be doing. You want to be going out there and saying, man, you know, all the competition that's out there and we have Raw and but SmackDown. SmackDown is the land of where the competition is here in this women's division. She said, but they are not Jade Cargill. They are not the headline. They are not a once-in-a-lifetime superstar. And another weather update, she said, the storm has arrived. Short and to the point. Didn't overstay her welcome. She came out. She signed the contract. She said what needed to be said. Uh, but it felt to me like it was too short and we were going to get more of her later in the show. Had she not come back out at the end of the show, because they promoted this all week, you know, and, and it was the headline thing in the SmackDown preview on the website all day. Like, they had Jade plastered there. So if this is all she did on the show, it would have felt underwhelming. Uh, and so she did end up coming back out later in the show. But like, that entrance they gave her uh, is fantastic. It's very, very simple, but again, you just see, you see that silhouette walk out there, and, and the way that they shoot it, they probably have the camera guy maybe crouching down a little bit. She just looks, again, she looks like a superhero. It's why I said when they first signed her, and they brought her into the company, and there was a lot of talk about her level of experience, and is she ready to be on the main roster, and obviously... We know how WWE and Triple H felt because it's taken this long to get her on the main roster. It's been several months. Uh, but you can understand why they would make her the first signing of the TKO regime, which is what she was. She was the first person they signed and brought into the company since the merger. Because how do you not look at this woman and not see superstar and megastar written all over her? So if she can put it all together, it's not like she can't work at all. Right? I mean, she was the TBS champion. She had matches. She had singles matches in AEW. The funny thing is, I think her best match in AEW was the last match that she had, which was against Chris Statlander, who's very good. Uh, so it's not as if she doesn't have the tools to become a great worker. You know, she may get there one day. 
She doesn't even have to be the, the best in-ring worker in the company. All she has to do is be able to go out there. And when they put her in the ring with somebody on television or in a pay-per-view match for 10, 12, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, as long as she can go out there and not embarrass herself and look like she has two left feet. Because we've had people over the years, especially on the male side, who come out, they got big muscles, they got a great look, right? They look like a million bucks, and then it doesn't pan out because the work isn't there. You know, the work is important. The work is not the only thing, but it's an important part of the package. And if she could put the whole package together, the sky's the limit as far as what she can do. I mean, I see her being somebody who, you know, years from now, she's going to be branching out doing movies and TV and other things. You know, eventually that'll be her. I think she'll get there. I think that's why she wanted to come to WWE in the first place, because she knew that these opportunities would be afforded to her. If she wanted to go to that next level, this is where she needed to be. That's why she made the move. That's why Tony Khan was so flustered when he talked about losing her. And he said, well, you know, we had negotiations and she came back to me with a, with a demand for how much money she was looking for. And I gave it to her. Like I said, sure, we'll give you, I'll give it to you. And she still left because her mind was already made up. And anyway, so yeah, the, the entrance, I think, was uh, spot on. And uh, she's a rock star. What more can I say? We had the Street Profits against Austin Theory and Grayson Waller, with the winners moving on to the Tag Team Championship ladder match at WrestleMania. In the first 90 seconds, Angelo Dawkins body-checked Grayson Waller over the announce desk, and in the process of soaring over the announce desk, he took out Corey Graves on the way down. That took us into a commercial break. Back from the break, the heels had control. They were working over Dawkins until he caught Waller with a T-bone suplex. Montez Ford got the hot tag, and he cleaned house. Ford hit an avalanche blockbuster to Theory off of Dawkins' shoulders. Waller, though, broke up the pin. Theory tried a rolling move on Dawkins. Dawkins caught him and hit a power bomb. And now, up on the screen, we see the locker room backstage with Bobby Lashley and BFAB. Bobby Lashley and BFAB were on their feet, drinking champagne, having a good time earlier before the Street Profits came out for their match. They were no longer having a good time. They were down on the ground. You saw champagne bottles around them on the floor shattered. And we see Karrion Cross, and he's got a champagne bottle in his hand and he looks into the camera and he tells the Prophets, boy, you guys are missing one hell of a party. So this distracted the Street Profits. Montez Ford is standing on the top rope the entire time because he was getting ready to hit a frog splash, so he's distracted. Angelo Dawkins is leaving. In the middle of this match, they are fighting for the right to go to WrestleMania to challenge for the tag team titles. And in the middle of this match, this man begins to leave. So as he's leaving, Montez Ford says, all right, let's get this over with. He dives off the top rope. And of course, on the way down, what happens? Theory gets his knees up on the uh, frog splash, and then he rolls up Montez Ford for the win. Grayson Waller and Austin Theory are going to WrestleMania, and the Street Profits are shit out of luck. AOP. Now, I should mention that Dawkins immediately runs back to the ring like, What happened? What happened? Well, you left your fucking tag team partner. That's what happened, buddy. So he gets in the ring to check on Ford. AOP ambush them from behind. Here comes the rest of the final testament down to the ring. Here comes Karrion Cross and the whole crew. Well, the whole crew being uh, him, Scarlett, and Paul Ellering. Now here comes Bobby Lashley eventually. He tries hobbling out to the ring. Ultimately, though, at the end of all this, he gets taken down by Karrion Cross. So this was a predictable outcome here. Right? We talked about this on the review last week. The Street Profits are already involved in a story that is clearly unresolved involving this other group. So you knew that they were going to get involved in some way and they were going to screw them over and cost them a tag team title opportunity at WrestleMania. And that's exactly what happened. That's how it played out. Uh, Waller and Theory have been you know, pretty consistently featured on the shows. Not necessarily winning a lot. Uh, but, you know, sending them to WrestleMania so they have a spot on the show, that makes sense. Uh, 
Uh, it would have been weird for them not to have any role at all on WrestleMania this year. And it has not been announced, but you would have to think that there is a six-man tag coming involving Lashley and the Street Profits against Karrion Cross and AOP. They did not announce it for SmackDown next week. I don't know if they're going to add that to WrestleMania. It would seem like that would be a WrestleMania match on one of the two nights. Uh, nothing has been made official, but I think that's where we're headed. And it better be, because again, Bobby Lashley should not be left off the WrestleMania card for the second year in a row. That would be bullshit. Now, Legato Del Fantasma was out to the ring next before a commercial break. So they stood out there like idiots for five minutes. Santos Escobar, Electra Lopez, Angel, and Humberto. Escobar said he's the one who put Rey Mysterio on the shelf for months, and he knows that he didn't get the infection and the amputation that he wanted. I forgot about that. I did. I forgot about that one promo where he wished that Rey's leg would get infected and he would need it cut off. He did not get the leg amputated, but... He got the next best thing. He got to beat Rey Mysterio in the center of the ring last week. He said Rey used to be the greatest luchador of all time. He outsmarted Rey, and all it took was one phone call to a man that despises Rey as much as he does. Cue Dominic Mysterio's music. Dom came to the ring. He shook all of their hands. We had a member of the Judgment Day here on loan to Legato tonight. Not officially, but kind of felt that way. Escobar thanked him from the bottom of his heart, and he wanted to apologize. He said he knows they didn't see eye to eye at first, but he told Dom, you were right. So Dom spoke, or tried to, through all of the boos. He said that he would do everything in his power to make sure that his deadbeat dad's life is a living hell. Out comes the deadbeat dad. Here comes Rey Mysterio and the entire LWO, Carlito, Zelina Vega, Joaquin Wilde, Cruz del Toro. They all make their way into the ring, so now we have a standoff between the two groups. Rey tells his son that he thought he was done fighting him, but now that Santos has dragged him into this, and clearly he wants to be a part of it, he came to the realization that this moment, having the two men that he despises more than anything in the world in front of him is truly a divine intervention. Now he finally has the chance to beat respect into the both of them, and he extended a challenge to Santos Escobar and to Dominic to face him and a partner of his choosing at WrestleMania. So Dom wondered, all right, which one of you dorks in the ring is going to be my dad's partner? And Ray said, it's not going to be any of them. It's going to be the newest member of the LWO, Dragon Lee. And Dragon Lee came out in his new LWO t-shirt. He got it to the ring and joined them. Electra Lopez then started getting a little spicy with Zelina Vega, who hauled off and slapped her across the face. Both women brawled uh, out to the floor. They tumbled through the ropes out to the floor. Everybody else started brawling. Legato ended up on the floor with Dom. And Dragon Lee went to the top rope. He soared, did a big dive, like a swanton dive from the top rope, wiped them all out. And then he got back in the ring and he hugged the other members of the LWO. So it played out exactly the way that I said it would last week. If you remember, uh, I said it looks like we're getting a tag team match. And some people thought it would be Carlito. One person, and this was after the fact, I heard from a bunch of people who said, when I, when I said it's going to probably be Dragon Lee, because Dragon Lee is the one who would make the most sense. And people were like, well, what about Andrade? And I hadn't thought of Andrade, because my brain, you know, I'm still in SmackDown mode here. Even though Dom is a Raw guy, it kind of would have made sense also, right? Yeah, they could have had Andrade be the one. Judgment Day has been watching him. They've been trying to recruit him. And so he could throw it back in their face and be Ray's partner and wrestle Dominic at Mania. Like, yeah, I could have seen that. But this, to me, still is the idea that makes the most sense. Because Triple H clearly is, is you know, he's a fan of Dragon Lee. He was getting a decent push for a while. They cooled him off. Whatever the reason was, he disappeared for a while. I don't know if there was a reason for that or if they just didn't have anything for him. You know, I, I don't know. It was kind of weird the way he vanished for like five or six weeks. 
But they were pushing him pretty hard. He's a tremendous talent. And some people have said like he could be the heir apparent here in this company to Rey Mysterio. So for him to get the rub by teaming with Rey at WrestleMania makes all the sense in the world. Him being in the LWO makes all the sense in the world. And now the match is, if it's not official, it will be soon. It'll be Rey and Dragon Lee against Escobar and Dominic at WrestleMania. Uh, and I like that match. I think that's going to be a great match. Backstage, Naomi approached Bianca Belair and wished her good luck in her main event tonight against Dakota Kai. And if Damage Control tries anything tonight, she says that she's got her back. Now we cut to a different part of the backstage area, and we have the Judgment Day. No crowd noise in the background. Totally silent. So you can tell that they filmed this on Raw Monday night. That's my guess anyway. So they were caught off guard by Dominic going out there and joining with Santos Escobar. Uh, even Rhea was caught off guard. She said, no, I had no idea he was going to do that. So Dom walked in. Finn Balor asked, is there anything you want to tell us? And he said, well, I just wanted to make everybody proud. I'm sorry. Then he said he needed to see a doctor. So J.D. McDonough said, come with me. I know where the trainer's room is. They went and walked off. Priest said that WrestleMania is too important for them, not only as a group, but as individuals. And then Rhea asked Priest if he has something that he would like to share. And they ended by saying that WrestleMania is going to belong to the Judgment Day. So teasing a Money in the Bank cash in. I feel they've been teasing a Money in the Bank cash in since July. <laughs> so this is nothing new. And we've had multiple attempts by Priest to actually cash in. And usually it's always been foiled. So now they're again teasing the possibility of a Money in the Bank cash in at WrestleMania. And I always feel like when they really, when they start teasing it, or outright telling you that this is what we're going to do. This is what's going to happen here. Uh, it does not bode well. It does not bode well for whoever the holder of the briefcase is. So I don't know if they're going to attempt something at WrestleMania. My guess would be yes. Or else they wouldn't be planting the seeds of an idea. Uh, does that mean that he's going to walk away with the title? Not necessarily. But my, my gut is that if he is going to cash in his money in the bank that he is probably going to walk away with the World Heavyweight title. If he tries to cash in. If he cashes in successfully, ding, 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 it's official. I think the chances of him winning the title are better than not. But there's no guarantee. There's a lot of different ways that that can go. I mean, you could have a scenario where Drew McIntyre wins the World Heavyweight title and CM Punk is sitting there on commentary and CM Punk is obviously not happy and Drew is gloating and... You know, Damien, maybe he lays him out. I don't know. I don't know physically what Punk could even do. He still has the bad wing. I, I don't know if he could physically. I can't imagine he would get him up for the GTS. But something happens where Priest comes out, cashes in, and then Punk could kind of throw it back in his face. Like, yeah, you won the world title, and then you fucking lost it, right? That's one way it could go. Uh, but you could also have Priest try to cash in and, and fail. And then it leads to dissension within the ranks all over again in the Judgment Day. Because you have to imagine that at some point after WrestleMania, not too long after WrestleMania, we're going to get back to that. We're going to get back to a point where things are not great in the ranks of the Judgment Day. And they're teasing something again with maybe Balor and Priest that they lose their tag team titles, right? How's that going to go over? Um, so... That's something to keep an eye out for. But again, they've been teasing the cash-in now for so long, it's... I mean, who knows? Who knows what they have in mind? Uh, we had Angel and Humberto. They stuck around for the next match against Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate with the winners moving on to the ladder match at WrestleMania. They joined the match already in progress because who gives a shit about these four guys, I guess, right? Even though this had WrestleMania implications, right? Who cares? We'll just join this in progress. Humberto hit a powerbomb. Angel followed up with a springboard moonsault for a near fall. They then did their double press slam from the middle rope, which is always impressive to see. They picked up Tyler Bate. He had a long way down, slammed him down to the mat. Pete Dunn had to break up the fall. Dunn, at one point in all this, spiked 
Uh, was it Humberto? I think it was with a nasty DDT. And then he and Bate finished off Angel with their Birmingham finish for the win. Pete Dunn and Tyler Bate are going to WrestleMania. I'm happy for two teams in particular in this ladder match next weekend. DIY, they are seeing their very first WrestleMania, as are Pete Dunn and Tyler Bate. And I think, frankly, they both have more so DIY than, than these two. Uh, at least a decent chance of walking away as tag team champions. Again, I think Gargano, Gargano and Champa more so. Uh, but I'm very happy that they're getting their first WrestleMania match next weekend. Uh, and considering it coming under Triple H, that really isn't all that surprising because Triple H is the one who brought them in to NXT in the first place. Why? Because he saw something in them. That's why he pushed them as hard as he did. Especially Gargano and Champa. He built the black and gold around them for a significant period of time. Not because... Well, it's just a random thing. Well, I guess this is all we got. No, he recognized the talent in these two. And he basically built that brand around them for a period of time. So we know Triple H is a big fan of Gargano and Champa, and he's also a big fan of these two as well. So now we know the complete lineup for the ladder match, and we have Finn Balor and Damian Priest defending their titles against The New Day, DIY, Miz and R Truth, Grayson Waller and Austin Theory. And the new Catch Republic. That is the lineup. And as far as Angel and Humberto, they, they have the out. You know, they were involved in a brawl before their match even started. So they need an out. There it is. Then they aired a full recap of the show closing angle from Raw on Monday night, where Cody Rhodes was ambushed in the back by The Rock. First, he made his surprise appearance at the beginning of the show in Chicago. He came out. He whispered something in Cody's ear. And then two hours later is when he reappeared. He attacked Cody from behind, beat this man so badly he made him bleed. And so they aired that. Then they had exclusive footage, which wasn't so exclusive because The Rock posted it on social media earlier today. When the show went off the air on Monday night, the cameras kept rolling. And they showed some of this here. Very a very limited snippet of the post-show attack that continued. He kept whipping Cody. They cut out all the profanity, and there was a lot of it, because it's The Rock. So they cut all the profanity out of it. That didn't air. Uh, but it was a great angle. And I will still maintain, and boy, did I upset some people on social media. That's funny to me. You know, I, I, cut, I came on here on Monday night and was glowing about that show. Right? I said it was an excellent Raw, the best Raw of the year, the best Raw maybe in many years. It had a different energy to it. You had several great segments on the show. I, I still think the best segment, even more so than this, was the CM Punk segment with McIntyre and Rollins. So it was a great show, and I enjoyed it. But I made two comments on my Twitter, right? Fuck me. I mean, heaven forbid. One comment was, boy, you know, this show has really gotten me excited. I can't wait for WrestleMania when I see Cody Rhodes against The Rock and I see Drew McIntyre against CM Punk. And I said, oh, wait. <laughs> because it really did. I mean, the matches that that show really got me excited for were matches that we're not even getting at WrestleMania. You know, we're not getting Cody and Rock one-on-one. -on -one. We're not getting Drew and Punk. We're not getting Rollins and Punk. Because we can't. Because Punk got hurt. But I was just making a comment. Then I made another comment about how, man, Cody doesn't even try to throw a punch. Like, Cody never even lifted a finger to try to defend himself, to try to fight back against The Rock, at least pretend to try, right? Which I think is a valid criticism. Doesn't mean I hated the segment. I enjoyed the angle. But, you know, all the bots in the stands, I mean, their heads exploded, right? It's like, boy, you must be a miserable person. You could find fault with that show on Monday night. How dare you? These people make me laugh, man. They really do. They really do. It's, it's good for a laugh. It's good for some entertainment, I will admit. But I maintain my criticism. My one criticism of that segment is that we at least should have seen Cody try to throw and try to fight back against The Rock, and then he would have been overwhelmed. He would have failed. He would have still been busted open. The angle would have played out exactly the way that it did. 
That was my only critique, and I still maintain that. Now, this man needs to come out guns blazing this Monday at the Barclay Center. That's what I want to see out of Cody Rhodes. Now, backstage live here, Paul Heyman revealed, big reveal here, that the final boss took out Cody Rhodes on Monday by orders of the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. Then Jimmy said that by orders of the tribal chief, Solo Sokoa is going to take out Jey Uso. That'll be on SmackDown next week. Those words are very important here, and I want you to remember them. By orders of the tribal chief. And yes, it is not lost on me that we have Solo Sokoa wrestling Jey Uso next week. I cannot tell you the last time that Solo Sokoa won a match. It may have been against John Cena. And what, I think that was in Saudi Arabia in November, right? It's amazing how dominant he was, and he gets the win over Cena, and I cannot even tell you the last time that this man got a win. So throwing Solo in there against Jay next week, I mean, a year ago, they did the same exact thing a year ago. I'm almost positive that they did this on Raw a year ago, right before WrestleMania. Might have been the final Raw before WrestleMania. I think they had Cody against Solo Sokoa. And Cody beat him. And so they're doing the same thing here only with Solo and Jay. But again, those words, by orders of the tribal chief, are very important uh, because the final boss, it's in The Rock's name, right? The final boss does not take orders from someone else. That's what makes him the final boss. So if you don't think that that was in foreshadowing in some way, it's Roman asserting his authority because ever since his cousin came back, He has felt second fiddle in this entire thing, and that's because he is. He has been playing second fiddle this entire time. So here we have Roman Reigns finally speaking up and asserting his authority because he feels like he's been marginalized by The Rock. And they're going to come back around to this. This this, This bloodline power struggle is coming after WrestleMania. This was just another seed planted. And it almost feels like a throwaway segment because Heyman, again, it's a backstage segment. Heyman said a few words, probably didn't take more than 20 or 30 seconds, but this will end up coming back around. This was an important segment here uh, because it's going to play into the story. Now, AJ Styles was out to the ring for a promo. I don't know what diet this guy is on. AJ is looking, how old is AJ now? Is he 45? 46? This guy is as jacked as I've ever seen as I've ever seen him. You know, even Randy Orton, when Randy Orton came back, Randy Orton had quite the physique, and he's softened a little bit since he came back. But AJ is, I mean, he's all goosed up right now, man. He's ready to go. So he blamed the fans for LA Knight coming to his house and assaulting him in his front yard last week. He said that he is going to expose LA Knight for the overachieving, under-talented piece of trash that he is. He said he knew that Knight was in the building, even though I think Nick Aldis told him earlier that he wasn't. But he said, I know you're in the building. He asked if Knight would uh, come on down to the ring. So you're going to walk down the aisle and come on down to the ring. No L.A. Knight. So then he speculated that maybe the cameraman is L.A. Knight in disguise. And he grabbed the cameraman and wasn't L.A. Knight. Then a random dude, I think in a ski mask, jumped the barricade and tried to storm the ring, but he got uh, grabbed by security. He pulled the mask off. Turns out that guy also was not L.A. Knight. Now, by this point, A.J. is standing outside the ring. He's right in front of the announce desk. And he's standing on the outside, and he's saying, you know, are we done with these games? Are the games over here? But if you look, there was a, a man dressed in black, a security staffer, standing next to the announce desk. Clear as day, it was L.A. Knight in disguise. And, you know, wig wig and all. So he pulls the wig off, ripped off his disguise. He put a beating on A.J., put him in the ring, stomped a mud hole in him in the corner. Then he went outside. He grabbed a chair, got back in the ring, took a swing at A.J., but A.J. bailed, and he retreated through the crowd. So Knight went back outside. He grabbed the microphone. He stood on top of the announce desk. And he called AJ Styles trash. He did his catchphrase. The good news is that LA Knight may have cooled down just a little bit 
but he didn't cool down that much because this crowd was big into LA Knight. So you can't say that, man, they've killed LA Knight. Despite their best efforts, they have not. Because it sure feels like this, their best efforts have been to try to cool this man down as much as possible. But the fans still love LA Knight. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that this just feels so secondary and so unimportant compared to everything else on that WrestleMania card next weekend. I mean, it is truly the very definition of an undercard match. And I was hoping that Knight would end up in a bigger spot. That is disappointing. Hopefully, come SummerSlam, we could get something between him and Logan Paul uh, for the U.S. title. Because, you know, I, I'm pretty... I'm pretty sure that Logan Paul is probably leaving Philadelphia with that U.S. title. Uh, so they could still do it at some point later in the year. But I don't know, you know, AJ Styles, I mean, speaks for himself, right? We know what AJ Styles can do. And LA Knight, still over, still popular with the fans. It just doesn't, it just doesn't have the juice to it. Like I said, it just feels very unimportant and very uninspired right now. So I hope they go out there next weekend and they impress people. But I also don't know that this is going to be the end of this feud. It actually feels to me like you know, Paul Heyman talks about what inning we're in with the Bloodline story. And it just feels to me like we may be in the fourth or fifth inning of the story between AJ Styles and LA Knight. They aired a Tiffany Stratton hype video uh, where at one point in the video, she vowed to always look hot and spare us from the uggos. And Dana Brooke tweets. The main event was Bianca Belair against Dakota Kai. And there was not much to this. The only thing that really mattered was the post-match angle. Uh, Bianca had control early. Skipping ahead to later on in the match, Dakota went for a running knee on the apron. Belair moved, and Dakota's knee ran into the ring post. Bianca went to the second rope to hit a deadlift superplex, and she followed that with a spear and the KOD for the win. So instantly, as soon as she gets the win, and they announce her as the winner, here come the Kabuki Warriors. And the Kabuki Warriors, they run out. Attack Bianca. Naomi runs out. She's delivering on her promise. She said that she was going to watch Bianca's back. So she comes down to the ring. Damage control, though, the numbers game, just too much. And so damage control ends up gaining the upper hand. And that is when Jade Cargill's music hits. And out to the ring she came. She booted down Asuka. Dakota went for a kick. Jade caught it and then flipped her up into a pop up power bomb. That looked cool. Kyrie jumped on her back. Jade just shrugged her off and then grabbed her and hit her with her jaded finish from AEW and pinned her just the way she used to win her matches in AEW. Hits the jaded, hooks the leg, leans all the way back, and the fans counted along. They counted one, two, three. So the Jade gets up. I don't know what she was wearing. I mean, she was wearing, it was like flesh toned. I don't know what it was. was it, it wasn't fishnet. I don't know what it was. It had like little diamonds on it. She she looked, <laughs> she looked unbelievable. And so she stands up in the ring and she's looking at Asuka. Asuka's in the aisle way. And they're staring each other down. Bianca gets up. Naomi gets up. And they close the show with a cool shot of Naomi, Jade in the middle, and Bianca standing shoulder to shoulder with the giant WrestleMania sign above them in the background. Clearly teasing a six-person tag match for next weekend, which, from what I saw before, I think has since been confirmed by Nick Aldis on Twitter, uh, that it will be a trios match at WrestleMania. So, first, another week where the women close the show. This has been a pattern recently on WWE television, especially on uh, SmackDown. But they also closed Raw a couple weeks ago with Becky and Nia. So, yet again, the women close out the show. We have another WrestleMania match teased, which has since been made official. Um, and so they are going with the idea that, again, I did, I've been discussing now for weeks. What have I been saying? Bianca, Jade, and Naomi against Asuka, Kyrie, and Dakota. Or they could do the tag team title match, which would be the Kabuki Warriors against Bianca and Jade. 
and you put those two together as a tag team, and Naomi could wrestle Tiffany Stratton. It was going to be one of those two ideas. I like this idea, and this is the idea uh, I think that makes more sense, because, you know, you have somebody here in Dakota Kai who was on the shelf since May, and she just came back. And it would be pretty shitty for her if every other member of Damage Control is accounted for and had a match at WrestleMania. This woman fought to come back, and she's the only one left out and the only one without a match. This way, it gets her in a match on the show as well. And frankly, I think Jade and Bianca are still going to end up winning the tag team titles from the Kabuki Warriors. It's not going to be at WrestleMania. It could be a backlash. It could be a TV match. I still think that probably is the direction that we're headed in. And eventually, we'll get the match between Bianca and Jade. That's not until much later on. But that's going to be a big money match for them down the road. You, know, you don't rush right into that right now. But that's a match that they can do later on. Uh, I don't have an issue with the belts not being on the line. Like I said, I think that they, they will be very soon. Um, I thought they did a great job with Jade tonight. I applaud them for the job they did here introducing her. Uh, they established her on night one. As a dominant player in the division, they gave her two segments on the show. The first one where she came out and she let it be known why she's here, right? That was her mission statement. And then they had her make the save for the baby faces. So she got that big heroic save at the very end, the big dramatic entrance, laid out all the members of Damage Control, uh, kept the baby faces looking strong. And I think having her in a tag team match, if they're going to have her at WrestleMania, Having her in a tag team match is smart. That's the way to go. You don't want to rush her into... See, it's one thing to say, okay, we have a pay-per-view coming up. And we're going to put Bianca, or, or Jade rather, we're going to put Jade in a singles match against whoever. It doesn't matter who it is. It could be Dakota Kai, right? But this is WrestleMania. So it's the biggest event all year. And real estate on that show is very limited far as who gets on the show and who doesn't and you got the butterflies in your stomach and it's probably nerve-wracking right to be in front of 65,000 people like that big stage you don't throw this woman out there in a singles match at Wrestlemania when you just debuted her a week before Wrestlemania she's still an unproven commodity in a big environment like that yeah she had her run as champion in AEW but she never had a big feature match like a big singles match at a WrestleMania. It's better to have her in a tag team situation where she can she can make the hot tag and get the big pop. And then she could come in and she could clean house and she could hit all of her big moves and she can look dominant, make her look great, right? That should be the key right now. The key should be whatever weaknesses she has. And I don't know how much training she's been having over the last couple of months. I don't know how many days per week she's at the PC putting work in. If it's two days a week, if it's five days a week, uh, I don't know what improvements she's made since she was in the Royal Rumble, right? It's been a couple of months. Maybe she'll impress people when we start seeing her in matches on a regular basis on TV. But she's probably still a work in progress. And as long as she's still a work in progress, you do what you can to hide whatever weaknesses she still may have and make sure you focus on what's going to make her look best. And that's what's going to make her look best. So I think it's the right position to put her in. Um, again, not the most exciting episode of SmackDown. This was not a great show. It certainly was. It certainly got smoked by that show we saw on Monday night. But I do like the fact that we had the other stars of the roster. We had the other stories have a chance now to play out. Instead of the focus just being on The Rock. Instead of the focus just being on Cody and the Bloodline. Uh, I think it was necessary for them to have a show like this. And now starting on Monday, again, Rock and Roman are coming to Raw on Monday night. Not only are Rock and Roman coming to Raw on Monday night, they've announced that the first hour of the show is commercial free. <laughs> so we're probably going to get an extended Bloodline segment to open that show on Monday. So that way they don't have to worry about commercials and they can go as long as they want. They may take up the first 45 minutes of the show. The only the, the drawback to having these commercial free first hours is that we get absolutely blasted in the second and third hour. So get ready because you know it's coming. Just because you don't have commercials in hour one doesn't mean you're not going to get a shit ton of them in hours two and three. 
But that's coming up on Monday. Hopefully Cody will at least try to get his revenge. Uh, and I think it's fine if they want to have like a big, you know, pull apart or some kind of big brawl, like just mass chaos. Adam Pierce waving everybody under the sun, the whole roster, the geek squad, just wave them all out, try to break things up, all right, get a hot angle going on Monday. That's what I'm hoping to see. Either that or if they want to give us a, a really great promo segment, maybe Pierce says, look, Rock, I know you're the final boss and all, but we have an understanding here that there is to be no physicality and you're, you guys are going to be on your best behavior. But then Cody's going to really have to come at him with some bombs on the microphone. And uh, we'll see. It's going to be a very interesting night on Monday. What they did announce is that next Friday uh, on SmackDown, we are getting the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. And I gave you my prediction for this a month ago. I told you. They're going to have the Andre Battle Royal on SmackDown. They've been doing that the last two or three years. And Braun Breaker should win the Andre Battle Royal. Braun Breaker was not on the show tonight. Uh, they had a video package last week for him. He's another one who they debuted him a few weeks ago and sort of disappeared. Kind of weird if you're going to do that. Why you wouldn't wait until after WrestleMania to debut someone new like him, I don't know, unless they want him in that Battle Royal next Friday. He's my pick to win. I think he should win. And, you know, you look at the future of SmackDown right now, They've got Jade. They just debuted her. They've got Tiffany. Tiffany's looked great since she debuted. Tiffany, in a very short period of time, is, is almost getting over like a baby base, okay? She, she has a lot of fan support, more than she should, playing that character. So they got Jade. They got Tiffany. Those are two big additions to the women's division on SmackDown. Braun Breaker, he's going to be a guy to build around, right? The pieces are there coming out of WrestleMania on the men's side and the women's side. Uh, to start building around some of these younger people, some of these newer people. After Stand and Deliver, my expectation is that we're going to see Carmelo Hayes back in the back up on the main roster, probably on SmackDown. That's where we saw him before. Uh, after his match with Trick, I think he's on his way up for good. And so the future looks good. As far as, you know, you have some fresh talent added to the show, mixed in with who they already have. They got Orton, and you've got Owens, and you've got LA Knight, and the bloodline is still part of SmackDown. So you have a good... They have a good mix there. And then they could blow it all up in the draft. But I think things are things are looking good for the future of SmackDown coming out of WrestleMania. Here's the Twitter poll. How would you grade SmackDown for tonight? And with nearly a thousand votes in soon, almost. 61% thumbs up for tonight's show. 27.2% thumbs in the middle and 12% thumbs down. It's not the 92% that you guys gave Raw on Monday, but that's still a pretty good score. I, I, I told you on Monday, I can't remember the last time I saw one of those polls that lopsided in, in the positive column. There have been some god-awful Raws going back years where it was the inverse of that, and it was like 90% thumbs down. But that probably was the best reviewed the, uh, the best rated episode of Raw that I could ever remember reviewing. Just based on those scores alone. Can't remember the last time that happened. Alright, let's take a look at your Super Chats, as promised. Thank you all who have dropped one. You still can if you would like to. And uh, I think the first one, was it the real CS? I believe it was. Yes, it was. Let me see if I can get him up here on uh, on screen for all of you. He may not be here. All right, we'll get to that list in a second. But let's start with the real CS02. He has a question. Thank you for the 499. He says, if Rock pins Cody on night one, how do you think they're going to protect him in defeat? This is the usual bloodline interference. I think that there's a very good chance that Cody is going to eat the pin on night one. And if they have a commitment from Rock to wrestle Cody Rhodes, and they may not have it locked in as far as the event, you know, SummerSlam would make sense. But, you know, Rock after Mania, Rock, I think at the beginning of May, uh, Rock is leaving to go film a movie for a few months. So he's going back to his movie making, and I don't know when he'll be back again. 
But if they're going to do Rock and Cody, then you have Rock pin Cody on night one. So that way, you can always come back to it and Rock can say, I beat you once. I beat you once, boy. I can beat you again. That, to me, would be the business move to do. So I think that makes a lot of sense. We have got... Troy King. What's going on, Troy? Paul Ellering has the easiest job of all time. Paul Ellering was basically a favor hire. Triple H likes him, Triple H respects him, Triple H brought him into NXT. And so Triple H wanted Paul Ellering on the main roster, and that's why Paul Ellering is there. We have yet to hear Paul Ellering say a single word. At least not since he first debuted. Maybe, maybe he said something. I don't even think the night he debuted, I think he just walked out there. DEH Sires, to think that Vince released Dakota is crazy. She's the perfect women's wrestler. Hope she gets a title run this year. She makes everything look smooth. Uh, Daddy Ball. Thank you for the 10 bucks. Could you see WWE selecting a group of cities to construct Hall of Fame buildings displaying different memorabilia? Love the podcast. Now, I don't see them... Uh, if you're talking having... You're talking multiple locations in multiple cities? Uh, I don't see that. Uh, I do think one day we'll have a physical Hall of Fame, but it'll be in one central location. I don't see them having, you know, kind of a, a bunch of, of different buildings. I just don't know. I mean, the expense of that just doesn't seem to make sense. To me. I think, if anything, you would have it in one central location. Hey, Prince Vegeta, what's go, boy? Bree mode, huh? I thought I heard something. <laughs> oh, boy. Been a while since Bree mode was unlocked. Amazing. Again, I'll, I'm going to get to the ones you see on screen. Some of the early ones aren't aren't in the list here, so that's why I'm starting off screen. Uh, Prince Vegeta says, I feel like AJ needs this Mania win more than LA Knight. Because can any of us remember the last time AJ has gotten a major win? No, I can't. And I actually, I actually agree with you. And I think that there is a very good chance that that's exactly what's going to end up happening. The Mount Vernon Kid. Christopher Bennett. I do like the gift. Thank you for the sword. Yes, I got a sword as a gift. We are both, we are both uh, old school Thundercats fans. So, uh, Christopher, again, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Very cool. Dr. Bropio says, food poisoning is no joke. Last week, I suffered a potential life-threatening food poisoning thanks to Subway. Now I am more careful in what I eat. What did you order? I just had a Subway sandwich uh, on Tuesday. It was actually very good. Although apparently, they, I was told they changed their flatbread. Uh, I usually get a flatbread sandwich when I when I order a sandwich there and I did again and usually I'm like yeah toast it now they're like no no you don't want to toast it I said I don't because I could have sworn I just asked you to she goes no 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 with the, it's new bread now it's new bread if you toast it it's going to be hard as a rock so I don't know what they did to their flatbread I'm like okay I guess we're not toasting it anymore apparently they changed it so Uh, but yeah, I mean, well, that sucks. I hope you feel better. I don't need the gory details, though. You can keep that to yourself. I can't, I can't gloss over the fact that somebody sent me a sword. Yeah, he sent me a sword. Big fan of the show, and he, he sent me... Remember the Sword of Omens? I got this. You see, it's almost more like a, um, like a dagger. It's kind of like the size of it is kind of midway between a full-length sword and like a dagger. It's kind of like medium size. But it's the old Sword of Omens from uh, from Thundercats. I mean, again, completely unexpected. I didn't know what it was. I opened it up and I said, wow. So now in the, in the last two weeks, I have received a barbed wire baseball bat and a sword. I'm like a one-man militia here. I'm, I'm building up 
I'm building up a lot of artillery. Apparently a great war is coming. <laughs> I'm like one of these guys that uh, has like an underground bunker. <laughs> what was that guy in... Uh... Oh, I forgot his name already. In uh, in The Last of Us. He's a... Um... They have a word for it. And uh... I forgot what word they use for it. But like he's... He's got this whole bunker of nothing but guns and ammo and stuff. And he's... He's ready for something. He's ready for some kind of battle. Uh, MacTub. Uh, there. WW, uh. I don't know. This, this super chat came in weird. It says, there any WWE title matches better than Punk? Oh, are there any WWE title matches? I see. Uh, better than Punk and Cena at Money in the Bank for you. Punk and Cena, Money in the Bank in 2011. Uh, oh, Prepper, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. The Doomsday Preppers. That's what it is. The Preppers. It was the Bill and Frank story from, from The Last of Us. I was thinking of Bill. The word you're looking for is crazy. That's, that's another good word for it, too. I don't disagree with you there. Survivalist. Well, in any event, uh, are there any WWE title matches better than that one? Probably, yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of great WWE title matches over the years. I can't rank them all. Uh, Cena and Punk and Money in the Bank, though, is, is one of my all-time favorites. It's just an example of everything coming together perfectly and the stars aligning. In one night, it was the right place at the right time with the right circumstances. Punk was supposedly on his way out of the company. They were in Chicago, so Punk was super over. The crowd that night was just unbelievable. And they had an excellent match. And with the right outcome, too. Punk beats him and wins the title. So it's up there. It's I just can't sit here and tell you it's like the best title match in the history of the company. Because uh, there have been a lot of great ones. Austin Rock, WrestleMania X7. Uh, you know, Bret had a bunch of, of great title matches as well. The cage match with Owen at SummerSlam in 94. I, there's, there's too many to rank. But it's on my list for sure. It is definitely on my list. Hey, Michael Dodd is coming in with a $5 super chat. What's going on, Michael? Thank you very much. Michael says, All this confirmed on Twitter. Jade, Belair, and Naomi against Damage Control at WrestleMania. I did see that before. I did see you mention that. So, it is official. Uh, St. Clair with the 499. Thank you very much. My mother just passed away recently. And I want to say that I appreciate your streams and the sound offs for taking my mind off of everything. Peace and love. Uh, St. Clair, my condolences. I'm very sa sad to hear that. Very sorry for your loss. Uh, there is no... There are, there are few situations, I think, in life that cause as much pain as, as losing your mom. And there's really nothing I can say to make it any better other than we're thinking about you. Very sorry to hear that. Uh, Rodimus Prime with the $20 says, What is, in your opinion, the most overrated and most underrated match in WrestleMania history? Why, you know, with these questions, my God. Overrated? I, I don't know what the most overrated and underrated are. I, I don't know. But I have always maintained and... I don't think I'm actually in the minority on this. I really don't. I don't think it's as much of a hot take as some people think uh, that the first Iron Man match between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels is one of the more overrated matches in WrestleMania history. I stand by that. Is it the most overrated? I don't know if it's the most overrated, but it's pretty high up on the list for me. Um... As far as underrated WrestleMania matches, I guess there is one match that I was just thinking of the other day uh, that doesn't get, I think, as much love maybe as it should, but it was actually an excellent match. I went back recently and I watched it. Uh, it was the opening triple threat match from WrestleMania 34 for the Intercontinental title. It was uh, Seth Rollins, Finn Balor, and The Miz, I believe. Uh, and that was an excellent match. And I kind of feel like that match doesn't get talked about enough. 
Yeah, the Ronda Rousey match where she debuted with Kurt Angle against Triple H and Stephanie on that show. That, that to me, stole the show. Um, so you hear people talk about that, and people talk about um, how disappointing that AJ Styles Shinsuke Nakamura match was on that show. Brock Lesnar and, and Roman Reigns in the main event sucked. That's one of the worst WrestleMania main events of all time. But that opening match deserves some love. Jeremy Watley. Tony Khan has a great assortment of talent between AEW and Ring of Honor. He needs to stop focusing on Eric Bischoff and start focusing on getting people over. Words to live by. Stop focusing on Eric Bischoff. Dr. Bropio. They gotta cut a match off the WrestleMania card so we can watch a 20-minute Roman Reigns WrestleMania entrance. 20 minutes? <laughs> Boy. I think you're uh, I think you're you're underrating how long that entrance may be. Rock may beat him though. Rock may end up having a longer entrance than Roman this year. If they come out separately. I'm assuming they're gonna come out separately. Arabian Night, Lashley missing WrestleMania again, shaking my head. Kind of thing that could make a talent want to leave. This cross feud was doomed from the start. Should have done Lashley against Braun Break. Still possible that they could add that six-man tag to the WrestleMania card. I could see that being a pre-show match. They're going to have a two-hour pre-show on both nights. The pay-per-view, by the way, be aware. They're doing earlier start times going forward. So instead of 8 o'clock, WrestleMania proper starts at 7. So the pre-show, I believe, starts at 5 o'clock each day. I would think they're going to want to have at least one match on each pre-show. I could see that being a pre-show match. Which, again, would suck for Lashley, because he should be on the main card. But I could see that being added as a, a pre-show match next week. Tokes Kazim. I curse Triple H for not bringing back the Hurt Business because that Final Testament feud is or shit. Yeah, I agree. I think that this feud uh, pretty well fucking blows. Alex, brother solo. Thank you for the ten bucks, bud. Says with stars wrestling in high quality matches well into their forties and fifties, what age would you consider to be prime in pro wrestling? I I don't look at it that way. I think because of what you just said, there really is no prime age. I think the prime age probably used to be... I would say prime age in wrestling was... 35. And... Because I think back to some of, the, some of the greats, and when they got really good and started having their greatest success, and it was around that age. It wasn't, it wasn't even so much early 30s. It was like mid to late 30s. So I, I always kind of looked at that as a wrestler's prime. But I don't even know that you could say there is a prime age now. I mean, there are some guys that are doing it into their late 40s, early 50s who can still go. There are there are guys who maybe suffer one too many injuries and they're already pretty much washed by the time they hit 40. I mean, it pretty much depends on the person. So I don't even know if there is necessarily a prime age. Um, I still kind of feel the same way, 35-ish, like somewhere in that range. But you're right. I mean, there are guys that are going longer and longer. You know, as long as they take care of themselves and they can stay relatively injury-free. Uh, look at Randy Orton. I mean, he had a very serious back injury that almost ended his career. And how old is he? Orton. Orton's probably, what, 41? Maybe 42? And he says he wants to go another 10 years. And I could see him doing it. Tay Tay the Savior, I would take Tiffany Stratton over Dana Brooke slash Ash by Elegance 10 times out of 10. Yes, I would as well. Sean D. Yeah, right. And the high, I mean, tribal chief who gave the order's name was... Sol what? If you're, using, if you're using their Samoan name, I'm going to butcher it if I try to say it. Saluli? I gotta respect Paul for trying to spin this in Roman's favor, though. 
So you're assuming that he is lying when he says that this was not ordered by the tribal chief. But if he's flat out lying, though, he has to know that that's going to come back and bite him on the ass on Monday. I don't know. Maybe The Rock threw him a bone and he said, okay, I'll carry out the order for you this week. Orton's 44. Wow, I didn't think he was that old. Okay. So he's going to be 44 years old? Yeah. I mean, so there you go. I mean, Orton, he, he made his comeback. And as long as he can hopefully stay healthy as far as his back goes, he wants to go another 10 years. John Cena said that he wants to go to 50, and then he's going to call it quits. And Cena's 47. So it all depends on one's health. The Real CS, Jade against Bianca at WrestleMania 41 with Bianca as a heel. Uh, the Juliet with the $25 Brie mode unlocked. Says, AJ said, look out at WrestleMania. He might be getting a new theme. Def Rebel is going to screw up another theme. God, I hope not. Oh, I hope not. Prince Vegeta 95. What was that song he was using towards the end of his TNA run? Oh, my God. Oh, I like that song. What the hell was it called? In the chat, remind me what that song was. It was like six... Something six. Um, it was really good. I really like that theme. And uh, if they can get the rights to that, I'd love to see him use that theme song again. I just don't remember the name of it. Evil Ways. Where did I get six from? Who's the band that does it? Evil Ways, though, is the song. I liked Evil Ways. If he brings back Evil Ways, I'd be okay with that. Prince Vegeta. 95. You ever think that we will see the infamous Snake Pit DDT segment with Hogan? Holy Grail of lost WWF footage since we got the Tom McGee match. Yes. The Tom McGee match was lost for a very long time. And we did finally get that. I guess, well, I, I guess that would be the Holy Grail now, wouldn't it? I don't know what else would be. We probably aren't going to get it. I'd like to see it where Hogan got DDT'd on the snake pit and the people cheered when they weren't supposed to. This was in 86. And it aired on TV in exactly one market. And that was in Rhode Island. And it was never shown anywhere else. As soon as Vince McMahon heard the fans cheer Hogan getting DDT'd by Jake, he said, that's the end of that. Which I could kind of understand because Hogan was his golden goose and he didn't want to do anything to fuck with that, so... It's never aired anywhere else. Unless you unless you lived in Rhode Island, then maybe you got to see it. But if not, it's sitting in a vault somewhere. Uh, Juliet, I did not forget about you. I got sidetracked, but I did not forget about you. I'm going to get to you right now. The Juliet had dropped a $25 Super Chat, for which I am very thankful. Braun is currently one half of the NXT Tag Team Champions with Baron Corbin at the moment. We'll be defending its Stand and Deliver next week. Also, rest in peace, Louis Gossett Jr. Yes, I was very sad to hear that he passed away. He was in a whole bunch of different movies. A lot of 80s films. He may have been in... Uh, actually, one of my favorite movies is The Principal with uh, Jim Belushi. And I think he was in that movie. I think, I think Gossett was in that movie. Uh, yes, I am aware that Baron Corbin and Braun Breaker are currently the NXT Tag Team Champions. What do they call themselves? They're uh, the um, the Dogs. What, what's their what's their tag team name? Dogs something Dogs. I don't. Know. I was gonna say War Dogs, but I think that's that's Bullet Club, isn't it? But they're gonna lose. They're probably gonna lose. I'm. Exp I mean, I'm. I'm assuming they're gonna lose those titles next weekend. It's Stand and Deliver. So then they won't be the champions anymore. The Wolf Dogs, not the War Dogs. I said, I, War Dogs, I think, was Bullet Club. 
Wolf Dogs. The Wolf Dogs. I haven't been watching NXT as closely as I used to. I kind of fell out of it. I, I check it out every now and then. But uh, NXT, meh. NXT is not what it used to be. Prince Vegeta, thank you again for your super chat. Give me back shots, Sala Monster, with a $2 super chat. What brand does Mello go to after the call-up? SmackDown's been getting all the talent, so he probably should go to Raw. Is where he should go. The Mount Burning Kid, Christopher Bennett. Will you pick up Becky's book? Uh, I... The physical book? No. I might pick up the uh, Audible book as many of you should, and if you do, there's a spiffy little link in the description of this video down below. You can get Becky's book for free. But you gotta sign up for the actual 30-day trial. If you don't sign up for the trial, it don't count. You actually have two books you can get for free on me. You can get Becky's book, you can get Ronda Rousey's book. So, uh, if I do, it would be the audiobook, but... Uh, no plans right now. I'm a, I'm a little busy right now. <laughs> I'm not rushing out to buy Becky's book right now. Uh, Kendall Howard. Why don't they just do No Holds Barred for Styles and Knight? I feel like that fits this feud and Knight's style. Keep up the great work solo. Because I think it may be the first in a series of matches. And if that's the case, then they would do a straight singles match first, and then they could bring it back at Backlash, and at Backlash they can have some sort of Extreme Rules type match. Or Balls Count Anywhere in the Building match, or a Last Man Standing match. That's what I think. Manuel Macias with the $5 Super Chat. Does Roman and Cody having little build-up mean there is a chance that Roman retains? Hope I'm wrong. Can you see Roman or Rock pushing for Roman to retain? Roman Reigns cannot beat Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania without killing Cody. You cannot have Cody Rhodes go into his second straight WrestleMania main event and lose. You can't do it. You just cannot do it. If you want to kill Cody off, then go ahead. But he has to win at WrestleMania. That's it. However it happens, he has to win. He cannot go into two straight WrestleMania main events and lose. Rob G. Batista's instrumental theme beats his lyric theme. It's pretty badass. I have to agree, it's a pretty badass theme. Omando Bastien with the five bucks says, Hey Solo, are there any memorable WrestleMania America the Beautiful renditions for you? Some that come to mind were Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin is the one for me. Aretha Franklin, and I remember uh, Reba McIntyre, WrestleMania 8. I think it was America the Beautiful that she did. Uh, that one also stands out to me. Did Lillian ever do one? I'm sure Lillian Garcia must have done it once. But I mean, Aretha Franklin is kind of at the top of the mountain there. So even Vince's intro of her when he introduced her. Uh, Reek Gotti. I don't get all this Cody hype. He's not that guy. Sorry to break the news to you, brother. But he's about to be. And then we'll find out if you're right or if you're wrong. But he's getting the shot. Nightmare LLC. What do you think Phil's saying on the MMA hour? Yeah, CM Punk is going to be Ariel Helwani's guest live in studio on his show on Monday. And according to Ariel, nothing is off limits. Which, of course, is not true, because there will absolutely be stuff that is off limits. Legally, there will be things that CM Punk cannot talk about. But he is going to talk about AEW, because I'm sure Ariel is going to ask him. And so it's going to be a very interesting interview on Monday. I am looking forward to that. Boney. Favorite wrestling meme? Well, I, I I can't say Lonely Virgil anymore. I guess that would be inappropriate. 
I mean, the Batista one was was a favorite of mine for a while there. Give me what I want. Right? That, that's an oldie but a goodie. Um, the Hogan meme, which really is just the tweet from 2011. Uh, good night to all the Hulkamaniacs. We're, we're, working a work. What was it? Jabroni Marks working a work. Or, I forgot. <laughs> I actually have it framed, by the way. Shout out to the person. Forgot the name popped out of my head. Who gifted it to me. I get some weird fucking gifts. Who gifted it to me. It is a framed image of the Hogan tweet from 2011. And it is an all-time tweet. And I'm so happy that he did that. Because I think Hogan deleted the tweet a few years ago. He, he must have gone back and deleted it. Because I don't think the tweet actually exists anymore. But that was just a meme in and of itself. It's just so great. It's so great. All, all the jabroni marks who worked themselves into a shoot. Worked a work. A, don't work a work. Or, I forgot. It was so preposterous. It was so great. It was so great. The real CS says, I know it's not going to happen, but it would be cool to hear. Get ready to fly one more time for AJ. Uh, Barry MK, what era of WWE had the best looking titles? Uh, the golden era. Golden era of the 80s into the 90s. And the Mount Vernon kid, Christopher Bennett with the 499. What did you think of Al Snow's heel theme? Al Snow had a heel theme? I don't remember it. I just remember his babyface theme. I, I know he used to come out to different themes every week when he was the European champion, depending on what country he was representing, but I don't remember his heel theme. I have no memory of, of what it sounded like. I'm drawing a blank. But of course, you know, his babyface theme. Everybody knows that. Thank you, Chris. The uh, goal tonight for Be The Booker was 400 likes, and we are currently sitting at 442, so uh, we are approaching 450. Let's see if we can get there. And before I get to that, I do want to uh, give a quick plug here. There will be no SmackDown review next week, so just be aware of that. I will be live on YouTube on Monday after Raw, Wednesday after Dynamite. I will not be live uh, at this point. Not planning to be live after SmackDown because I'm going to be driving home from Philadelphia. While everybody is getting into Philadelphia for WrestleMania weekend, I will be driving home to New York and leaving Philadelphia. But I will not be home in time to watch SmackDown, so there will be no review. Uh, I will be in Philadelphia that Friday, though, because House of Glory is hosting a joint show with Wrestling Revolver that Friday in Philly at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you can't join live at the building, you can watch it and stream it on Triller. This is the ordering page. It's up right now. Triller, the uh, former Fight TV. It is up right now. I believe you can buy the show uh, individually. You don't, uh, I don't believe you need a Triller TV subscription if you don't want one. I think you can get the show for $9.99. So, got some big matches on that show, including Amazing Red going one-on-one -on -one with Mustafa Ali. That's going to be a banger. So that is coming up next Friday. That is where I will be and why there will be no SmackDown stream next fi Friday. Unless I can, uh, what? Well, I should watch SmackDown in my car on the way home. Really? Should I swerve off the road? What are you, what, what are you, what are you doing to me here? Putting me to work on my commute home? I don't think so. Let's be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the Booker. There they are, Roman Reigns and The Rock. It will be on Raw Monday night. We'll see if there's any uh, any drama there between them. We'll see. They're going to have a commercial-free first hour, so they'll have plenty of time to do their their cinema, as everybody calls it, their uh, Bloodline Cinema on Monday. All right, tag team, be the booker. 
WWE is fleshing out its WrestleMania card, so I'm going to book one myself. And uh, we're going to begin with Hookhausen. The team of Hook and Danhausen, which is still preferred to Hook and Chris Jericho. I'll take this team over, over Jera Hook. I'll take these two. Danhausen and Hook are going to be taking on the Hart Foundation. Oh my God, Bret Hart, Bret Hart and Danhausen in the ring together. Oh boy, Bret Hart and Danhausen, Jim Neidhart and Danhausen. Well, what would Jim Neidhart think if he took one look at Danhausen? He'd probably knock the shit out of him, is what he would do. I'm giving that the bell. You can give it the buzzer if you want to. I see Hart Foundation. It would take a really shitty team to get me to hit that buzzer. All right, women's be the booker. Spice things up here with the reigning WWE Women's Champion, EO Sky. Off to a great start here. There is no bigger name right now on SmackDown. She's the champ, at least for another week. Who is EO going to be defending her title against? Is it going to be Bailey? I'll shit a brick if it lands on Bailey. EO Sky gonna go one on one with EO Sky. Oh, it happened again. It happened again. Only this time, it is the NXT Women's Champion, EO Sky. See, this is a very different EO Sky. We had main roster EO Sky first. This is NXT EO Sky. These are two completely different EO Skies. But yes, we got another mirror match. Wow. EO, EO Sky against EO Shirai. How about that? That would be a fucking great match. Yes, it would. Sky and Shirai. I love it. EO against EO, and now we come to our main event. We come to our main event of the evening. Can we do it? Can we run the table here and go three for three? I want to see Brett sell the Danhausen curse. We begin with Kanosuke Takeshita. The Alpha, who is 0 for 2 in big matches here in the month of March. He started the month losing to Will Ospreay. He lost to Swerve Strickland on Dynamite on Wednesday night. But I think we're off to a great start nonetheless. Kanosuke Takeshita, one of my favorites right now in wrestling, honestly. As far as in the ring, is watching this kid right here. I mean, I say kid, he's... What is he, 30... Probably 32 or 33 at this point, but... Takeshita. Boy, you know, it'd be hard for him to have a bad match with, with him in the ring, but with some of the names that are in here, anything's possible. Takeshita, one-on-one -on -one with Sheamus. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I like the sound of that. Sheamus and Kanosuke Takeshita. There's going to be some black and blues in that match. Those two men are going to beat the living crap out of each other. And I am here for it. I am here for it. And not only am I... Oh, Takeshi's 27? Why did I think he was in his 30s? I thought he was like 31 or 32. All right, so he is a kid. So I can call him kid. <laughs> These men are going to end up bruised and battered at the end of that match. And I'll tell you what. It might not be all that unrealistic that we are going to get that match. Because I think it's very possible that we may see that match even sooner than you think. And there you go. That is a good night right there in Be the Booker. There you go. That's how you want to end the week.
I think we may be getting that match. But that's how you uh, wrap things up on a Friday night. We had a an eventful SmackDown as far as that lady right there, Jade Cargill, made her presence felt tonight. We had some more matches established for the WrestleMania card next week. Not as much star power as we've had on some of these shows, but I thought it was fine. And we will be back on Monday night talking about what should be a very big Raw right here in my backyard. Although I will not be at Raw, I will be here with you. And we will talk about it when the show is over. But before then, we have episode 855 of the sound off dropping on Sunday, which will include a whole metric fuck ton of news and a dark side of the ring review on Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Some interesting stories there to, to talk about. So on that note, I will bid you adieu. Thank you very much for staying up with me. Thank you for all of the support. Uh, do check out the uh, memberships here on the channel. I did add, by the way, for those of you wondering, there is now a Blue Skull. I don't know that anybody has the Blue Skull, though, because the Blue Skull is 48 months of consecutive channel membership and above. And I don't know if anybody is quite there yet. But the first person who hits 48 months will be our first Blue Skull. So That is a new badge here on the channel. A shout out to all of our reds and golds and greens. You guys are awesome. Be well, stay safe, and uh, I will see you for episode 855. I hope you enjoy the intro to the podcast coming up on Sunday. It's a little tease. Until then, take care, guys.